it gives me great pleasure, and I am truly honored to introduce one of our uh, most wonderful speakers that we've had with the IOMT for many years, um, Dr. Boyd Haley. Dr. Boyd Haley obtained his MS in chemistry at the University of Idaho and his PhD in chemistry and biochemistry at Washington State University. He was appointed as chair and professor of chemistry from 1996 to 2005 at the University of Kentucky. He retired in July 2008. He has lectured throughout the world and testified before congressional committees in the Institute of Medicine regarding various aspects of mercury toxicity and neurological diseases. In the past several years, he has dedicated most of his research efforts towards the development of a safe and effective chelator for mercury, lead, cadmium, and other toxic heavy metals. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Boyd Haley. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is about my 30th year coming here and talking, and it's just tremendous. The first time I talked, you could have put all of you guys right here. And it's, uh, I've made some great friends. Uh, most of the good friends I have in my life are in this meeting or in this organization. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, we've been fighting for some time to try and get you know, an effective treatment for mercury toxicity, mainly because I feel sorry for a lot of my friends out there that are cuckoo, and they do a lot of dentistry. And I give them a hard time about that. But uh, at any rate, uh, we'll get this started today. And uh, what I'm going to tell you, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, the compound has been tested. Uh, you know, I started out, for those of you that don't know, don't know about uh, the NBMI or the Mer uh, the uh, Erminex we ha has different names. Not my choice. That's the drug development business. You have to name things differently. But this is the same thing as OSR that we uh, developed and gave to the community over t uh, 12 years ago. And we sold it for two years as a dietary antioxidant. I knew at that time that it bound mercury. That's the reason I designed it. But we were th it's what you claim to the FDA. It's not what the compound does. And I was told that by a major FDA lawyer, and so we wanted to get it out for autistic children. And we sold it for two years, and it was doing a great job because I was very close, slow and very careful about who I gave it to. And we had a stack of papers, an inch thick of emails sent to me by doctors and people with um, parents of autistic children telling me how well the compound was working. And, uh, but the FDA thought, or somebody, I decided that uh, if uh, something was curing a disease, it couldn't be a supplement, and they shut me down and put me on this 10-year march to try and get this approved as a drug. And I'm going to tell you some of the stories about it. But what I can tell you, all the studies we've done with this, we haven't seen, unless you give enough in an animal that you clog up his guts, it has, that has no toxic effect. And that's what their worry was, is that you're giving a supplement out that you might have a toxic effect that you don't know about, but we've gone through all of that, and there is no toxicity associated with the NBMI uh, on all, studies all the way up through phase two studies. So let's go there. This is a, a, a generic heavy metal test report, and this is what I want to tell you because this focuses on what the problem is. If you're talking about treating mercury toxicity, you're missing the point. Mercury will knock iron, copper, and molybdenum off of their natural binding sites and cause them to go out and be free. All metals that are heavy, if they're free, are toxic. Free iron is very toxic in your body, and your body generates a very complex biochemistry to make sure you have no free iron. Because if you have free iron, you can now transfer electrons to uh, oxygen, making superoxide anion, gets converted to hydrogen peroxide, and gets converted to hydroxyl free radicals, which is oxidative stress. And so keep in the back of your mind, all elements that cause oxidative stress do it because they knock free iron off the iron binding sites. They are not redox metals. They cannot donate the electron to make hydroxy radicals. And so if you look at this, General. This is just a general heavy metal report, and I have looked at probably hundreds of these, and many of you have sent me ones. And you see, there are a load of different metals. Look at the number of different metals that are toxic in this person at toxic levels. And so a good chelator would be something that would bind 
mercury, iron, copper, and any other metal that would be toxic in the body. And that's what I started out to do, was to generate something, one that first would get inside a cell, and then bind all the toxic metals. Because all the problems in the world aren't caused by dental amalgams. I have seen reports such as this, which would have uh, uh, toxic levels of, alum uh, pardon me, uranium. Now, where in the world would a woman living in Florida, mother of four or five children, get toxic levels of uranium? And she couldn't tell me. Her family couldn't tell me. But she had toxic levels of uranium in her blood uh, and, and in her urine. So I think there's a lot we can deal with. But I think right now we have something that can treat most of the uh, metal-induced toxicities that exist. And then keep in mind also something toxic like bleomycin, which is used to induce uh, COPD in rats for a model testing system, is not a metal, but it induces oxidative stress. If something induces oxidative stress, it's deplacing iron or copper off the native binding sites in your body. And so you bypass the bleomycin, and you'll see in the study we have here that NBMI will protect against bleomycin toxicity. That's because it's binding the iron that's being released by bleomycin when it binds to certain aspects of the body. This is the one thing uh, to tell you how, how uh, quick our government is to react. This is a study we talked about this years ago, and it's called, you know, for idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. And you have 22,000 times higher levels of mercury in the heart tissue of people that die of this disease. And this is a disease where someone's playing college basketball, running down the basketball floor and drops dead. It's called sudden infant, or sudden death, sudden cardiac death. And why would the government say there's no problem with mercury toxicity when you have this? And I can tell you, at least as far as I've ever checked, the NIH has not asked for any study to show where this mercury comes from or how it gets there or why these people collect it. But mercury does get inside tissues even when you don't have it in your body and it's not causing other problems and it can kill you. I mean, there's, that's common sense. It's published science. It's not just rationalization. And so I think it's very important that we, as a society, develop something because we're living in a cesspool of heavy metals that are put around by different commercial interests, et cetera, and we've got to have something that if someone feels like they're, they're not operating right, the first thing to do is get the heavy metals out of your body. Because heavy metals keep your vitamins from working, keeps the drugs that you might take that might work from working, so you've got to detox. It's got to be a critical aspect that we've got to address. And I think I have made a critical, fine, a critical uh, production and proof in that area for one compound that does it better than anything else, and I think Younger chemists coming in with more energy than I have anymore, coming up behind me can make even better chelators. This is something I know you all like to see, but if I went into this in detail, and guys like me love this stuff, that's because nobody knows <laughs> if we're telling you the truth or not. But if we looked at. <laughs> But if you look at this, this is a, a study where they're talking about the production of uh, hydroxy free radicals. First of all, you have to have something to generate electron. In the case of general oxidative stress, that's knocking iron off of the electron transport system of the mitochondria. And when you do that, you don't make ATP anymore. The electrons coming from the citric acid cycle pile up on the electron transport thing, and they leak into the, into the mitochondria. And the mitochondria is where you dump off your oxygen that you're breathing, and so you end up with oxygen and electrons, okay, and then so you form superoxide anion, and that's all on here. Uh, you can all look at it if you want, uh, and you can look on the, the thing. But essentially, what you need is iron. So when mercury blocks the electron transport system, it decreases your ability to make ATP, makes you have less energy. It piles up electrons in your uh, mitochondria, and it knocks off free iron off of the iron sulfur centers of the mitochondria, so you have iron and electrons, and you're breathing in oxygen, so you have a system set up to make catalytic amounts of hydroxy free radicals, which is better known as oxidative stress or inflammation to most of you if you go down to the bottom line. So that's basically it. So the main thing we have to do is make sure that the iron isn't there to form hydroxy free radicals. And you can do that 
by one, chelating the mercury that doesn't, uh, before it knocks the iron off, or if it knocks the iron off, chelate the iron. And NBMI will do, the compound we're going to talk about will do all of that. This next slide here, this is just a, st a study when I first came in and started talking about this is what I call co farm boy common sense. Why would you try to chelate a toxic metal that's toxic when it gets inside the cell by using a chelator that can't get inside the cell? It just doesn't make sense. And so that's the reason we start off in our development is to making a compound uh, NBMI that will go through the lipid bilayer. Uh, you know, and if you want to take a lesson, just look at the, the uh, ethyl mercury. Ethyl mercury has a positive charge on it, so it can't go through the membrane. I mean, charged compounds don't go through a bio biological membrane. But if you know about mercury, mercury binds chloride quite tightly, and your blood's full of chloride, so you form ethyl mercury chloride. You're uncharged, and you can pass, pass through the lipid bilayer and collect in the cells. And it does that. The other thing that's important for you to understand here is that if you look at the data on ethyl mercury from thimerosal, the one that's put in the vaccines for a while, you find out that the level of mercury inside the cytoplasm is five times higher than it is in your blood. Then when it gets in the, in the cytosol, it, it's, two th it's a thousand times higher, roughly, in the mitochondria than in what it is in the blood. So you're having it concentrated. So when people say it's not enough mercury, it's low level in your blood, well, certain compounds will concentrate, and they concentrate in the mitochondria because that's where the sulfur is. The, the electron transport system is uh, made up of iron sulfur complexes, so it's just sucking the mercury in because when it goes in there, it binds it and it doesn't let it go very well. And so you have, we have a lot of toxicity, and just looking at the blood and urine doesn't really tell you much of anything. Uh, but anyway, so we have a compound that, unlike DMPS and DMSA and other chelators that are commonly used, we have one that goes straight through and it binds the mercury. and Understand this, mercury vapor doesn't react with anything, not even NBMI. And so that's the reason mercury is so dangerous, is that when you get the vapor out off of your amalgams or off of any source from coal-fired power plants and you breathe it, that mercury is just totally not going to be attracted to anything. It has to get inside the cell, and when it gets inside the cell, at this point here, it gets converted to HG2+, so it goes from being totally non-toxic to being incredibly toxic by the action of an enzyme called catalase. And catalase pulls two electrons off of mercury, making HG2+, and now it binds to your proteins, displaces iron, because iron is Fe2+, and, or Fe3+, one of the two, uh, in the tissues. And that, that's how the toxicity begins. You cannot look at somebody who's been breathing mercury vapor, and we learned this adamantly when we tested the mercury toxic gold miners in Ecuador. They're breathing mercury at 50 parts per million. They'll have a high blood level of mercury. And yet, when we give them NBMI, their urinary mercury drops like a rock. And that's because the mercury in their blood stayed up high. It didn't drop as, high, as like the urinary mercury did because it's mercury vapor. And it doesn't react with anything. And you can take NBMI. NBMI can sit around with mercury vapor for a long time. And I know I can tell some, some of you some stories about everybody thought that all of these chelators bound mercury vapor. They don't at all. Mercury vapor has all the electron shells on the mercury filled, and they will not, it will not bind to anything except form a metallic bond with another uh, metal. Is, uh, and this is a structure of uh, DMPS and DMSA. And the point I want to make here is that these are not char these are charged at physiological pH. These both would have negative charges and wouldn't span or enter the cells of the body, and that's been shown by research also. And this is the key take-home lesson for some of you this thing, because this goes against the grain of what a lot of people believe. DMPS and DMSA do not form a chelate with mercury. They form a sandwich complex. There's not enough room. And this is a big difference between my compound and these two compounds is if you look at DMPS, it's like you're trying to catch a basketball and your hands can only be this far apart. You can't catch that basketball. And that's the way it is with DMSA and DMPS. The, the, the sulfurs on adjacent carbons do not have enough space between them for a mercury atom to set. 
so they form a sandwich complex. In other words, there will be two DMPSs on each one side of the mercury atom to carry it out, and that's the way glutathione goes, it carries it out too. So you can't do that. And so in my mind, what we had to do is we had to make a compound that the sulfur groups would be up here, and you could catch it with one hand and then bring the other hand in. Now you can catch a basketball. It's a simple concept, but it's just sterile chemistry to a chemist. And so this is the reason this comp our compound works so well. It can bind any metal with a single sulfur, and then it can orient exactly as the metal wants to chelate it. And this is important for iron because mercury has to be bound like you're grabbing a basketball on both sides. Iron doesn't like being held like it. Iron has a different coordination chemistry. If you look at it start binding in hemoglobin, you remember there's six sites, six coordination sites. Well, then you want something that can make six coordination sites, and our compound can do that. So, and this is the other thing. <coughs> Excuse me. Blow your breath. I'm sorry about that. I apologize. This is, the, uh, this is the binding or the PK value of uh, uh, DMPS with metals. And you see they got numbers. You have never seen a table like that with me with our compound because we can't make those numbers. If you look at the uh, uh, association, the on rate, if you have a reaction like this, you have an on rate going this direction and an off rate going this way. And if we make this compound, there's nothing on the off rate. You can't measure. You, make, you bind mercury with NBMI, it never lets it go. You can't measure any off rate. We can put it in a pellet, we can wash it with 10 millimolar EDTA, and you will never get the mercury off of NBMI once it's on there. It's the binding, infin it's infinity. I mean, it just doesn't do it. And so we don't have any numbers like this or any structure like this because it binds so tightly. And we, we've proven this early on when we were trying to make this, or a student in my, in my department was trying to make this to treat uh, mercury coming off of coal mining uh, aspects of coal burning, coal-fired power plants. And uh, so we would take 50 parts per million of mercury, or whatever metal we have over here. I think there's cadmium, iron. We did it with every one of them, lead. And you can see that NBMI would bind all of these different metals to the point where there would be very little left in the solution. And if you made this pellet, it precipitated, so it's not reactive, it's not soluble, it doesn't dissolve in the water, it doesn't release it, and you could try to knock the mercury off of this with all kinds of tricks. That We have yet to find anything that will knock mercury off of NBMI without destroying the NBMI molecule first, and that's 267 degrees centigrade. So this compound, and it binds the same with iron and others. I mean, this is not the same. It's not quite as tight, but it's, uh, there's, no, there's no off rate, not in the life that you would expect it uh, to exist in the body and become toxic. And so look, we look at this. This is, the, the, uh, this is from the uh, Dimaval uh, book about DMPS, and they had the, the uh, excretion of metals after mobilization with DMPS. And zinc and copper come off faster than mercury and lead. So, you know, that, that's not what you want to see. I mean, it, and it depletes your essential metals if you take this too long. Uh, if we do it, the comparison, NBMI has the binding affinity. It binds mercury much tighter than anything and then lead. But they're all kind of thermodynamically irreversible. And it does not have... Uh, it has an affinity for zinc, but if zinc or copper or iron, if we give that to a healthy animal, we don't remove any zinc or copper or iron because they're bound to binding proteins, and if they're bound to binding proteins, they're being transported around and being utilized, and where are they? They're in the aqueous phase of the cell or the body, and NBMI doesn't want to be there. NBMI wants to set over in a lipid bilayer, and it does not deplete the essential metals in every study we've done, and we've done at least six with detailed uh, uh, and we went up to 1,000 milligrams per kilogram in the rat studies, and we didn't deplete their zinc. And so this compound uh, almost makes me look a lot smarter than I really am, I can tell you that. I mean, it just turned out that way. But, you know, it's called follow your nose research. You, you get something, you throw it out, and you look at it. Oh, God, and look how smart I am, what I just did that I didn't know I did. And now let's talk about the plasma high fly. When you take a chelator, it's got to be in your blood or in your body where it can interact with the metal ions that you just ate or just breathe. And that's what this compound does. You look at the half-life of DMPS in, uh, 
this again is from the Dean of Allen, and I'm not anti-DMPS. I think that compound has a, a good place, and I, I can't wait till I get my compound approved. So some of you medical doctors can say, if I give 100 milligrams of uh, my compound and 50 milligrams of DMPS, do I get better excretion? Because you've got to move these metal ions around. Because DMPS, I, I mean, NBMI is not going to go into the hydrophilic aspects of the body and pull uh, mercury out. Maybe the MPS could model it, mobilize that, and it would work better. But if you look at the here, the T half-life in the body, in the plasma, of, in our, F, in our uh, phase one study, was 22 hours. In other words, you take a capsule of, mercury, of uh, NBMI, and 20, uh, half of it's still in your blood after 22 hours. So you have to take one capsule a day. The plasma half-life of DMPS and DMSA are in a matter of minutes. You can look at this data here, and uh, in the rats, et cetera, it, it goes out very fast because it's charged and it's cleared by the kidney and goes out in the urine or into your bladder very quickly. So it's not there long enough to really do a good job to search out and do it, whereas our compound sits there for some time, and we'll show you some of the data on that in just a minute. So there are differences. Now, this is the one I want you to... This is, this is where the chemistry came in with the idea of what I was looking for. And if you look at this compound, and you see that you can spin around this bond, you can spin around this bond, and you can spin around this bond, and you can move this around all over, and you can do the same thing here. So you can taste those sulfurs exactly where they need to be to enhance the coordination chemistry binding of many different metals. And if you look inside, there are two nitrogens right here that can, that if you look in the hemoglobin, you'll see that nitrogens are what fill in the electron shells of iron binding. So this compound can orient in different directions, and I think we can improve on this if I could live another 100 years, but I don't think I will. But, I, uh, but it's, this is really very efficient. I mean, it can bind many, many different metals at incredibly high affinity and get them out of your body and end, end their toxicity. And I think later on I'm going to show you data that shows that NBMI starts decreasing, eliminating heavy metal toxicity within half an hour of you taking it, at the most, because it, it peaks in all the cells of all the tissues we tested within two hours. And it goes in there, and it does not cause a loss of toxicity by eliminating the metal from the body. It uh, eliminates the toxicity by encompassing the metal in a complex where it's no longer reactive. And it cannot induce oxidative stress events. It can't displace iron or anything else. So, uh, so uh, I want to take a step backwards now. We, we recently, you know, I, I've not been a friendly with the FDA ever since they tried to tell me that dental amalgams were safe, even though we could put merc uh, one, of, one of you guys gave me an amalgam filling in a tooth, and I dropped it in a mill of water, and I tested it for toxicity against brain proteins on brain homogenous. It was toxic as possibly, could possibly be within 15 minutes. So the mercury coming off of dental amalgams is toxic. And don't make any apology for that. The FDA owes you an apology, or whoever said it was okay, because they didn't want to think. And the science was there. We, we demonstrated it, published it, and showed them face to face. Mercury vapor, or whatever you put, comes off of an amalgam filling in a tooth that's 55 years old or something like that, uh, produces toxic water that kills brain proteins, brain, critical brain proteins, very quickly. And, uh, but I think right now they're saying that the last meeting I had with them was the first time I've ever had a good meeting with the FDA. And it, it was, uh, they were professional and, congen and congenial, and they, uh, they're helping us uh, find a way to get our drug on the market to treat chronic mercury toxicity, and even indicated they thought that was an unmet clinical need that we'd be able to treat people for this. So let's, let's try to find a way, you know, like, like you had a divorce with somebody and you want to share your children. <laughs> you know, you've got to get, you gotta get along. You've got to say things. And so we should, we should try that for a while. And I think right now they may be more likely to want to do that than ever before. Uh, and this is a summary slide, because I don't want to go through all this, of everything with NBMI. First of all, we sold it for two years as a dietary antioxidant, which it was. They changed the rules on us so they could shut us down. 
I mean, it's, it's two natural products put together. If you look at it, the structure of NBMI is dicarboxybenzoate. Carboxybenzoates are used as food additives to preserve food because they scavenge uh, hydroxy radicals produced by metals reacting. And, uh, and then uh, cysteine, which is on the terminal end of coenzyme A, and it's just cysteine without the carboxy group on it. And so it should have been left alone. It should be across the t board right now, but I don't think I'll ever get it there in my lifetime. But it's a drug. And so we took it through all the drug things. We've shown that it binds mercury, lead, cadmium, iron, copper, uranium, arsenic, with exceptionally high affinity. And just recently, uh, we, we have uh, results that indicate that it will be good for gadolinium toxicity. It um, is a fairly convincing uh, proof, actually. Uh, and we found out that if you injected it into animals or gave it to them orally, it prevents mercury, subsequent mercury toxicity. It's also, it's a very, it's one thing when people say, how long do people, should you take this? I will tell you within two weeks of taking this compound, all the toxic metals in your body are probably chelated. However, you're under oxidative stress because your body's been damaged by the presence of those metals. And our compound is a very potent antioxidant. So when people say, it, it made me feel better, but I, 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 when I went off of it, I didn't feel as good, so I continued taking it. It's not because it's taking the metals out of your body any faster. It's because it's supporting the oxidative stress and reducing it, making more reduced glutathione in your body. So you guys can read all this as, as well as I can, and I'm not going to read it to you because I'm going to be short, short of time before. But anyway, we've made all the progress. We've had two phase two studies, and we're going to show you some of the data from that. And uh, uh, there's no doubt that it works. And we published a paper, and I would suggest all of you get that paper. We published it in uh, 2012, uh, and it's about uh, treating rats, injecting rats with multiple lethal doses of mercury on the left side of the stomach. And I did that because I didn't want to feed animals. I don't know how how you ever know what an animal, how much it eats, et cetera. But if you inject mercury on the, the uh, this is the paper, by the way, the left side of the body, uh, lethal doses, and the rats are going to die. We know that because we, we tested how much we had to give them to give them one lethal dose. And then uh, you uh, wait 20 minutes to make sure that it's around. And then on the other side of the gut, you inject the NBMI under the flab of the skin so it can go out and say, can it catch it? I mean, it's not, they're not bound when you put them in there. And what we found is some very uh, effective data. And this was published in Toxicology and Environmental Chemistry. And the results I got back from the scientists that reviewed this were outstanding. I mean, they said, my God, this is just exactly what the world needs. Because they have so many people dying of mercury toxicity, either in gold mining states, or uh, some people just can't excrete mercury. Normal American people that live in a clean atmosphere, if they get a few amalgam fillings, they're very likely going to collect the mercury and never excrete it, and they're going to get sick. Uh, and so the reports were, and I thought, this is a shoe, and I got the FDA on my side now, because this is really going to work. Uh, that's not the way the regulatory community works, I can tell you that. So, but here's a study that uh, I think got everybody's attention. If you look at this, this is the uh, uh, percent survival uh, and this is one times a lethal dose, and this is two times a lethal dose, and n they never died. We just treated them one time, one shot of the compound in the peritoneal, uh, subcutaneously in the peritoneal layer, and they never died. So then we went up to 14 times, and when we did that, uh, you know, they were none of them dead at six hours. If you didn't treat them, they were all dead at six to 12 hours. And, but if you uh, let them go, 67% of them never died. We kept them alive for three or four months to see if they would develop cancer or, or grow wings or something. And we couldn't tell them from normal rats. I mean, they just totally recovered. They didn't get sick and they didn't die. And if you didn't treat them, you can look at the level that lived if they weren't treated at all. I mean, they all died. And so if something's keeping you from dying, you don't you think it's remotely safe? <laughs> This is a problem with regulatory. I, I used to tell my students when I talked about bureaucracies. I said, bureaucracies don't have a brain, they don't have a heart, but they have one hell of a survival instinct. And that's the way it is. They've got, they've got to say, we're, in, we're important, and we don't want you coming in there curing all this without having us involved and paying us your, our $100,000 or $200,000 regulatory fee. So, but anyway, so we did this. 
Now, now think of the logic of this. You inject 14 times. This, in this particular group, uh, uh, we gave them a half a lethal dose because we didn't want them to die. And then we let them live up, and, and three of the 10 did die. They got, if you gave them NBMI, none of them died. But if you didn't give them NBMI, three of the 10 rats in this study died. And then you weighed them out to the end of the study, and then you whack off their heads, and you analyze their liver and everything else and say, is there mercury there? Well, yes, there is. As a matter of fact, there's no difference in the mercury level of the NBMI treated and those that aren't treated, except the, the main difference is the ones that got an NBMI are alive, their kidneys are normal, they're functioning, they're eating, they're putting on weight, and if you don't give them NBMI, they're dead. And so you have to say, how did it do that? And in the test tube in the laboratory, you find it forms an irreversibly inert complex when you react it with mercury. So you would think, well, maybe it's doing the same thing in the animal. I mean, that's what I would think. That's what I did think. That's what I do think. And it's, and it's right. And so when we did this, you can see the mercury level on these animals with mercury only and uh, with the NBMI, it did not remove the mercury but it stopped the toxicity, and that means it's forming an inert complex that just does not allow the mercury to be toxic. And uh, that's what we're doing. And we also did another study right down here. We made 2,000, we made mercury NBMI complex. I made it myself in my laboratory, and I sent it off to Southern Research Institutes to determine how toxic it was. You know, everything has a toxicity level, just about. And so they started out and saying, if it's not over 2,000 milligrams, uh, toxic at 2,000 milligrams, per, we're, we're not, it's not toxic. And so they did this, then they gavaged 2,000 milligrams of mercury NBMI. That's 1,000 milligrams of mercury per uh, Gavage, and that's enough to kill 25 rats or more. And it didn't, it didn't do anything. They were healthy as could be. They never showed any weight loss. They never showed any kidney de uh, deterioration, etc. So the mercury NBMI complex is not toxic. It isn't. It's like, it's just, it's like granite. It's just inert. And it doesn't react, and that's the reason that you, you saw. So when you start, if you're mercury toxic and you start taking NBMI, you start decreasing the mercury toxicity of the free iron, the mercury, the free copper, all the toxic metals in your body immediately because this compound goes inside your cells and binds it. It doesn't take it out. It just stops it from being toxic. It doesn't allow it to react with proteins or displace iron and other things that are normally done by free mercury. So uh, that's our story, and we're sticking to it. But the FDA can believe you. With, no matter how logical you are, they can say, well, we don't buy that yet. And that's where we are right now. So we're going to do some things that are, are there. And this is written out so you can read it. Um, and we, we've got a, a few other studies that are important because their fear was, even though it saved your life and you're not dead, is it going to stay in your tissue and build up and kill you later? And so we did this study. This is a 90-day study where we... We treated the rats with a milligram of mercury or something like that, and then treated them with NBMI to eliminate the toxicity, and then had some of them with just a milligram or, or less so that they didn't die. And what you see is that the mercury NBMI complex is eliminated from the body. It's eliminated slowly because it has to go through the P450 system, the, the natural detox, and it takes a long time to do it. But the, at the end of 60 days, you don't have any mercury uh, of the original, or very little of it, left in your kidney. And the same thing, but look how high it is in the kidney. It's very high. And so we look in the brain, and their other worry was, if you tie up this mercury in the kidney, in the liver, will it go to the brain? If it did, this would have gone up. And this particular thing, the mercury concentration would have increased with time instead of decreased. And it doesn't let it go to the other tissues. It doesn't translocate it from the liver and the kidney to the brain. It gets it out. I mean, it left in uh, the brain, and at the end of 30 days, most all of it's gone. And I, and I would tell you here now that if you were looking at iron in the brain, the iron disappears and drops off even faster. It, it gets excreted very quickly. But mercury uh, NBMI complex is tough for the P450 system to get rid of as fast as it, the, the FE iron NBMI complex. It goes out pretty fast. And this is a work we did, most of you have met Dr. Perinati. And uh, he's, this is uh, independent of me, except I, it was mostly my idea. I caught him, uh, uh, we invited him to give a talk here, and uh, he and I ended up doing a collaboration, and he was at Ohio State University. And what we were doing is, he was looking at the effect of mercury 
ethyl mercury and thimerosal on the biomembranes of the gut and the arteries because there's no doubt that it causes major things like leaky gut and atherosclerotic plaques. And so we did this and uh, we compared uh, uh, our compound, that's the, that's the name of it on the bottom there, nn bis 2 mercaptal isothalamide, compared it to the uh, effectiveness of other drugs. And uh, here's some of the data. Where the red arrow is, uh, the, uh, this is um, methyl mercury, pardon me, When you, add, when you add the methylmercury, the signal goes up. It's a release of proteins from the inside the cell. And you can see that if you, if you treat with uh, NBMI, it totally prevents it. If you treat with, what is that? That's uh, N-acetylcysteine and uh, DMSA, they don't protect. They don't bind tight enough to protect. This compound, I mean, that's an amazing result. I mean, we were tap dancing in the hallways when we saw this. And so if you look at this and look at this, get my slides, they're available to you, I think, you can see that when you do the test that toxicologically oriented physiologists do, this compound works wonderful at preventing the toxic uh, effects of mercury and thimerosal, et cetera. This is a DNA synthesis. People wonder about the effect of these children. And you look at the... NBMI, if you have NBMI present, you don't see any decrease in DNA synthesis in the presence of the toxic compounds. It still keeps it up, and it does the same thing here with either uh, methylmercury or thimerosal. So this compound can really protect the, the uh, uh, help you continue to repair your brain and, and do DNA synthesis. There's no doubt about it. And mercury and thimerosal and methylmercury are very tough on your, if you're trying to repair your DNA. And this is one that I think everyone should look at. This is a control. Here's the control. And if you give them uh, NBMI, their glutathione levels go up because control cells in culture are dying. I mean, you leave them long enough, they're going to die. They're going to die of oxidative stress because they don't have the protection. But if you put in methylmercury, they drop almost immediately and die, and, or thimerosal. But if you have NBMI, you don't see them die nearly as rapidly, or, if at all. So this compound takes methylmercury as well as mercury and converts it into an inert uh, biochemical complex. So um, you can read this as the summary of the biomembrane uh, research. And causing these protections, it seems as if a key contributor is the maintenance of intracellular glutathione. Now, I'm getting old. I'm old as dirt. And I've been taking NBMI since 2006. That's 12 years in my correction. And uh, when they test my blood glutathione levels, I have very, very high blood glutathione, much higher, almost like a teenager, if not like a teenager. And in my age, I should be really, really low. So this is a longevity drug, I mean, if you want to look at it. If you can keep, the reason old people die of the flu and get it faster than young people is not because they're out partying anymore, it's because they have higher levels of glutathione that can reverse you know, the, viral, uh, the effects of a viral infection. And they can do that because it's shown they have lower glutathione levels. Old people, when they reach something like 50, your glutathione levels start dropping down. And what you'd like to do is take something that would put it back up. And I remember when I was a young graduate student going to uh, the national meetings, listening to a stage, and I can't remember the guys are up there, but they were the intellectuals of the time, the old established people. And the one guy said, the holy grail of medicine is to find something that increases the intracellular glutathione levels. Because he knew about death. And, you know, and that's what I think we've done. And... Uh, so then you'll go back at it because you can almost always have too much of a good thing. And this is the studies of people who haven't heard this before of the chelator. And so I went, uh, I took rats in a cage and I thought, started injecting them with micromoles of uh, NBMI, the amount that I thought would be needed. And I was pleasantly surprised when we found that uh, if you gave them 100 or three, 200 or 300 uh, in the, these different groups, they didn't die. As a matter of fact, they looked happy. 
we called them show rats because they would groom themselves a lot. And they, they, if you didn't give them this, they had kind of a yellowish color to their uh, coats. They weren't unhealthy. And so then we went to 200, gave this group uh, 200 the next time, and 300, and then 400. And we kept going up like this. And to make a... To make a long story, at the end of it, I got frustrated, so I just gave them 1,500. And, and I, I was, again, they, they, it didn't phase them at all. They didn't act at all. They ate. They gained weight. They, they couldn't tell them from the controls, except they, they had nicer hair. <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to encourage the female uh, uh, purchasers of the compound. But anyway, so what well, you can say is the compound, you know, injecting it or taking it orally is not toxic. And at the level you would use, you would use 100 to treat somebody per day about that level for heavy metal toxicity. And this is an abstract. This was sent to us when I was at the University of Kentucky. You can tell there's, say, the sponsor was my grant at the University of Kentucky before when I was developing this. And it's acute oral toxicity, up and down procedure. If anybody knows about it, they give them a real high level and try and kill them. And then they start there, then if, like if the 5,000 milligrams per kilogram body weight killed them, didn't kill, kill them, they would drop it down to two and a half until they found a place where some of them would survive. Because you can't do a study if the rats are all dead after the first dose. And you can see that what this says down here, the, all animals survive the 5,000 milligrams per kilogram body weight. Now most of you out here, on the average, you probably weigh 70 kilograms. So multiply 5,000 by 70 and that's how much you can take as a human being and still be safe if you're a rat. And so that's a lot of milligrams. We use somewhere between three to six milligrams per kilogram body weight to treat people that are mercury toxic. And it works very effectively. So, and this was sent off, this was done by MB Research in the Spinner Town, Pennsylvania. And they, we ended up doing a study with them uh, where we gave a, a thousand milligrams per kilogram body weight for 28 days and none of the rats died or got sick or developed cancer or had any major problems. That tells you that the compound is exceptionally safe. Exceptionally safe. You can't, if you want to kill yourself or commit suicide, you're not going to do it with this compound. This is the one where, we're, where I'm really kind of concentrating on now. This is the environmental disaster where people are taking liquid mercury and, and they're using it to extract gold. And uh, this was out of a, an article. Uh, they're talking about liquid mercury is used by the artisanal. The people that are really, the, I don't think anybody's stupid or so much smarter than anybody, but they're not educated. They don't know, they don't have many high schools teaching them even basic chemistry. But they think mercury you can hold in your hand and it doesn't make you sick that day. They think they're safe. And we're, we're diluting them. We need to help these people. And if you look at them, what they do is they, they, they take the liquid mercury and they take it uh, ground ore where there's mercury in the ground ore and they swish it around with mercury. The mercury dissolves the gold. They filter off the rocks. And then they have a gentleman who doesn't know what he's doing taking a blowtorch and blowtorching the mercury, driving it off. And so, so his, probably his wife and his daughter and his young grandson can be there breathing mercury vapor like crazy. And that's the reason we have a nat the disaster in the countries like Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, etc. These people are doing this because they don't want to starve to death. And nobody's helping them. And I want to tell you, I am so disgusted with the eleemosynary groups in the world to say, hey, give me donations so we can go educate these people. They're not do they won't do a thing. You talk to them say, hey, we got a way that they can take a pill a day and not get die. They're not interested. They want you to give them money so they can stand up and give a talk in the Hawaii someplace, the way it's nice. So there's not really a, uh, a lot of concern about this. And if you look at the world, uh, there's where we're doing our next studies, right there in Columbia. We found a young boy found a bottle of liquid mercury that was used by this type of person to extract gold. He took it to his school, shared it with his schoolmates, and contaminated his school and made 128 people incredibly mercury toxic. And where we're now working with the Colombian government, uh, we've made our, all our data available in Spanish for them. I paid $12,000 to get it translated by an appropriate group. And uh, we're trying to have, encourage them to let us come down and treat those 128 people. And we're getting close to having them do that. But you would think that somebody in that country or any country, all of these eleemosynary groups that say, oh my goodness, you know, all these people are getting sick, we've got to stop mercury, etc. Well, get off your dead rear ends and 
read the literature, do something that's good, and get down there and get the help for these people. These young kids, if you have mercury for 10 years in your brain, it's not going to be as good a brain as if you only had it in there for a year. So let's get it out of them. Let's, let's neutralize it. But you can look around the world, and the interesting thing is, there's my ace in the hole, China. China has, the Chinese are stealing our product like crazy. You all know that. If you look, if you go get our drug and you want to buy it illegally, the Chinese are selling it on the internet. And they're going to be selling it in China. They're going to, because they have a serious problem and they don't have the regulators we have. I mean, I have to make it pure as a pristine snow and show that I can make it in three big batches before I can sell the first capsule while people are out there dying of mercury toxicity. So we, need, we really need to change the way we, we approve drugs for toxic developments like mercury. And this is the stability of the compound. This is the one thing that's important. If you're going to try and take this into the jungles of Columbia, you've got to say, will your compound last? And I can tell you, if you look across the top part here, we have tested this forever, five years in some cases, and it's never shown any sign of breaking down if you keep it dry, and, and even if you heat it. And you don't have to, I mean, you just don't add water to it. I mean, you put it in 70 or 60 percent humidity, it won't break down. This is a very stable compound. It's going to be a gift to the people in the jungles. They can take you, they can go into town, see a doctor, be given a, a, you know, uh, some capsules of NBMI, go back up in the jungle, and uh, eat fish or burn gold, and at least they're going to live. And so the compound is doing well, and it is stable. It's incredibly stable. Uh, we did, uh, people wonder, how can you take it? Well, we did a, a phase one study on Swedish students uh, at the Karlinska Institute. We gave them 100, 300, and 600 milligram doses in single ascending doses. And the thing is, there wasn't a single adverse effect with those uh, young students. And it worked, and we could look at the absorbance. Uh, there was, uh, I mean, the, the pharmacokinetics of this compound are just, you know, you dream about having that, the, the way it came. And we can look at the, uh, the AUC, means the area under the curve, which you look at when you measure the, where the compound comes off. It, uh, it, it increased in a dose-dependent fashion, as you would expect it to. So the doctor is not going to be confused if you give 300 milligrams or 400 or 500. You're going to know how much is getting in the patient. It's very simple. And it says only a minor part of the NBMI was excreted in the urine. It's not, it's, it's hydrophobic. It doesn't want to go in the urine. The way you get it in the urine is that NBMI binds to the hydrophobic pocket on human serum albumin. There's a pocket that is used to carry lipoic acid and fatty acids around your body, so when you eat a piece of fat, it gets to, the fat gets to where it gets digested. And so that's where it binds. And, the, the, and so when you, when you have kidney problems, you're urinating, you're urinating H human serum albumin. And the, the more toxic you are, the more human serum albumin you're urinating out. And it takes some NBMI with, with it, but it's a very small amount. For the most part, NBMI, when it binds mercury, carries that mercury out through the fecal. Very little of it goes out in the, the uh, uh, urinary tract. And this is the level that's in your plasma uh, after you increase the dosage, going from 100 to uh, 300 to 600. And you can see it goes up, but it's very linear and it's very stable and very repeatable in different patients. So there's some patients that may not absorb it as well, but we didn't find that. And we found out that if you gave it after somebody ate a fat American breakfast, you saw about an 8% increase in absorption. So you don't have to take it with food. And I take it draw straight all the time. My uh, approach is when I get up in the morning, I pour it out in my hand, make sure my mouth is full of saliva, and eat it. And it's not, it's not bad. It's not good, but it's not bad. <laughs> and so here's the... Uh, the study we did with the environment miners, and you understand this is what the EMA told us to do. Go study this on South American or African gold miners where they're really mercury toxic. But they didn't tell us we can't let them go back to work. So we let them, we gave them the drug, and they went back to work. And I think Dr. Kennedy went and measured the uh, ambient mercury uh, in Zaruma, uh, Ecuador, and it was 50 parts per million or something like that. I mean, that would close down a factory in the United States in a heartbeat. And so these people were coming in, getting their treatment, and then going back to burning gold or working in the gold mines and breathing mercury vapor. So we didn't get a 
stable baseline because they were constantly being re-exposed and they don't burn gold every day, they just burn it every other day or something like that. And so but here's, here's the take home lesson that's really worthwhile. If you look at the adverse effects, I mean the adverse effects they have from the get go and of the total numbers you talk to them, taking the NBMI, and I'll show you the slides, the 300 milligrams, cut the ambient, I mean, pardon me, the uh, adverse effects, not life-threatening, but stomach ache, headaches, inability to sleep, it cut them by 70%. The people that took 300 milligrams of NBMI were much healthier and much in, in better uh, physical shape than anything else, and we got this data. And here's a slide made by Dr. Kennedy, and uh, these are the top ones, all those, there's a control, untreated controls on the top, and then the 100 and the 300, and you can see the more you gave of the compound, the less adverse effects they had for health. I mean, stomach aches, mercury causes you to have leaky gut. It, it destroys your intestinal membranes. It, it, it destroys your arterial membranes. I don't know, you know, you're a biochemical crane wreck if you're exposed to this much mercury. Everything in your body is compromised. And so what we've shown is that treating these mercury toxic gold miners as bad as you can get uh, caused an improvement in their health. And now if we look at this, this is the control, 100 milligrams, and you can see they started out with this much mercury. Let's look at the 300. See how that drops down dramatically? And these are enormous doses. I mean, they think they're up over 350 parts per million, or micrograms per liter, I should say. And we saw 10 out of 11 people that took the 300 milligrams saw a dramatic drop in their urinary mercury levels indicating that NBMI was binding that mercury and rendering it not available for excretion through the kidney. And if you had the, the controls, this is the reason they, they didn't like it, because the controls went wild. They were not controllable at all, because it depends if you had two beers or one beer when you were watching your neighbor burn the gold off, the mercury off of the gold in his kitchen, like that fellow you just saw on this slide. So we had no control over the exposure level. We have since identified this group in Columbia that are not being real exposed where this child found a, a bottle of liquid mercury and took it to school and contaminated 128 people. And so we're, we're, that's what we're proposing to do this study again on uh, these children uh, that are not being re-exposed. But anyway, if you look at this data, you have to admit there's a change there. I mean, there's a, an effect of the NBMI on these patients. And this, again, is another slide from Dr. Kennedy. Uh, and it's showing that the controls have much more uh, pain and anguish and uh, illness than do those that get 300 milligrams. I can honestly tell you that taking this compound, when I first did it, it's more dramatic than it is now. My wife and I, we're farmers. I mean, we like to plant things. We like animals. And, and you know, you go out sometime, you get a spring day, you go out, and you know you've overdone it when you go to bed that night. You take this compound and your body pains won't show up the next morning. I mean, you won't have the cramping, aching muscles that if you don't take it, you can hardly walk and straighten up. This, this compound does a lot, and that's because exercise leads to oxidative stress when your mitochondria can't handle the load that you've given them. And this is the average decrease in the mercury levels in the 300 milligram group. Uh, you can look at this, um, and depending on how you present the data, you can see that if you take NBMI from the control, the percent uh, urine in your mercury drops dramatically. And that was only with a very short study. I mean, we could not do it. They wouldn't let us do it any longer than two weeks. And these people were incredibly toxic. Uh, and you can see the placebo didn't change at all. And we just talked about that. We can look at the Ecuadorian gold mine study. The following occurred. The existing non-drug-related adverse events were dropped by about 70%. The urinary mercury levels were significantly reduced in 10 of 11 treated miners at the 300 milligram level. Uh, the tremors. A lot of those people have tremors. And uh, this is one thing that we can always give. You see people with arthritis and tremors? And they take this compound, and within a week, their tremors disappear. And that doesn't happen with everybody. Okay, I just, somebody told me to just wrap it up, so I, I'm going to have to go through it, but I'm going to make sure. There's, 
Uh, this is the one that's critical. If you look at this one, this is the safety data on the HGMBMI complex. If you take rats, and uh, we're going to inject them with mercury, but before that, we gave them an oral dose of NBMI as a prevention, as half of them. And if you look at the rats that got the uh, HGNBMI complex, that's the amount of mercury in their kidney. If you didn't give them NBMI, they actually collected less mercury in their kidney because it's going in the cells. Now, and this NBMI goes into the kidney and prevents the to toxic effect was totally eliminated by having the NBMI present, even though more mercury collected in that tissue. And so this is what I think, and this is what every first responder should take if he has to walk into a burn, burning building. They should be taking this because the mercury off of fluorescent lights is set like in 9-11. They should be taking this ahead of time. And we don't have anybody anywhere in the government, anyone, I don't know if they're not anyone in the government intelligent enough to understand a little bit of chemistry, or they just don't care. But this is something that should have been arranged a long time ago. This is just more of the same stuff. Again, you see the flip-flop if you, if you, uh, if we do this uh, study, if you uh, have mercury plus NBMI, none goes out the urine. And uh, if you don't have it there, a lot goes out in the urine. And if you look at the amount in the fecal, it goes up if you give NBMI. And if you don't give NBMI, it doesn't go out in the fecal rod. So what we have here is a compound that binds the mercury in an inner complex. is processed by the P450 system that directs it to go out through the biliary transport of the liver into the fecal malter, and you don't have any kidney problems with this compound. It eliminated, it starts eliminating them quickly, and I hope I've made some sense to all of you. I appreciate your attention, and uh, this guy looks big down here, so I better quit. <laughs>